15 seconds. Okay. Hello, everyone, wherever you might be. My name's Alex Wilkie. I'm um, an emeritus professor at the University of Manchester and, and also a visiting research Hello. fellow at the everyone, University of Oxford. My name's Alex Wilkie. I'm um, oh, professor getting some feedback. And, and also a visiting research fellow. Sorry, green room. I'm okay. Um, anyway, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, joint invitees Gal Binyamini, Associate Professor at the Weizmann Institute of Science in Israel, and Dmitry Novikov, Professor of Mathematics at the Weizmann Institute. Uh, the talk will be on video given by Gal Binyamini, and his subject is Tameness in Geometry and Arithmetic Beyond O Minimality. Gal, uh, so the video can start now. Hello, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this uh, ICM. So I'm Galbin Yamini. I will be also speaking on behalf of Dmitry Novikov. And uh, I'll be talking about tameness in geometry and arithmetic uh, beyond O minimality. Okay, so let me start by uh, saying what I mean by tameness. So uh, uh, it was in some sense envisioned by Griffin Dick, this notion of tame geometry and topology. And uh, he wrote that uh, after, in an English translation, after some 10 years, I would now say with hindsight, the general topology was developed by analysts and in order to meet the needs of analysis, not for topology. So basically in set theoretic topology, you have all kinds of uh, uh, pathological examples like space filling curves that uh, we don't really expect to, to deal with when we are doing geometry. And the idea was that we should define some notion of topology and geometry, which is more suitable for the needs of geometry uh, proper. Uh, and O minimality is uh, one uh, candidate, successful candidate for such a theory. So the reason why it's been successful is that on the one hand it meets many of the criteria that were suggested by Rothendieck. So for example it allows for smooth stratification and triangulation of, of sets, uh, which is something that you want to have in a, in a tame topology. And on the other hand it's rich enough to contain a lot of interesting uh, sets or structures. So, for instance, it contains, uh, in appropriate sense, the moduli spaces of abelian varieties uh, by result of petals in the and it contains uh, variations of hot structures by more recent results of Bakker, Bonebach, Klingler, and Zimmermann. And uh, finally, it's already had a deep impact on arithmetic geometry. So, this is following the, the pila wilkie theorem and then various applications pioneered by, by Jonathan Pila and, and many others. Uh, so th this is why O minimality has been successful, but on the other hand, if I may paraphrase Jonathan Dick, O minimality was developed by real geometers and in order to meet the needs of real geometry, not for arithmetic geometry per se. So it was developed by uh, Van den Dries and he was thinking about phenomenon from real geometry, like uh, sub-analytic geometry, sub-exponential geometry, and uh, it wasn't really developed with these kinds of applications in arithmetic geometry in mind. And I will try to convince you that if we want to go deeper in the directions of these applications, we should really uh, somehow refine the foundation. So we should restrict from general or minimal structures to a certain more uh, special category of minimal structures which are suitable for doing uh, arithmetic geometry. Okay, but let me start by kind of recalling how, how tame geometry came to impact the Fantine geometry. Uh, so it, this story started with this uh, celebrated pila wilkie theorem, which I will uh, repeat now. So if we have a set of uh, subset of Rn, I'll denote by xgh the set of points in x where the coordinates generate an extension of degree g over q and the height of the coordinates is bounded by h. Okay, so usually when people talk about the pila wilkie theorem, they maybe introduce the case g is equal to 1. So you just count points where x is rational and you bound the height by h. 
and for my purposes it will be it will make sense sometimes to to generalize to to bigger g and then the theorem of pila and wilkie uh, is as follows suppose you have a definable subset of rn in some o minima structure then the number of rational points is subpolynomial in the height so that means that for any positive epsilon if you count the points of degree g and height h this will be some constant depending on everything times h to the epsilon i mean smaller than a constant times h to the epsilon now a few small remarks one is that the original theorem was g equal to one so this is a slight generalization in, in a later paper by pila and the second more important one is that we are not counting all of the points of a we are counting only this transcendental part so let me um, recall what that means so i'll denote by a alg the algebraic part that is the union of all the connected semi-algebraic curves in a okay and and in this part there's really no hope for this type of theorem and the algebraic curves can easily contain a lot of rational points so the content of the pillow will of theorem is that this is actually the only obstruction so once you remove the algebraic part that can contain many rational points the rest this transcendental part doesn't contain many rational it's a subpolynomial in the height. And that means that even though O minimality was defined from the point of view of, uh, of real geometry, actually the sets are tame also from the point of view of the finite geometry. If you, if you look at the rational points of the set, they have some kind of nice asymptotic behavior. Uh, and I'll just uh, mention that there, there's also a lot of work on extending this to other fields, to non-Archimedean fields. So in a, in a few works, Klackels, Comte, Lezer, and Foe considered analogs for uh, QP, where you count rational points in QP subanalytic sets, and also FQT, where you, you count polynomials in T for sets defined over this field of Laurent series, over a finite field. And recently, and okay, they did it for finite fields only of sufficiently high characteristic. Uh, recently, together with Kato, we, we made some analogs of this also for that work for every finite characteristic. And also, together with Novikov and Clackers, we have some versions of this and, and sharper results over Laurent power series uh, over the complex numbers. So, I, I will stick in this talk with the Archimedean situation, but I just wanted to mention that there are a lot of analogies and a lot of uh, active directions of research also in the non-Archimedean setting. Uh, okay, but let me give you an example just uh, to show how this uh, pillow wilkie theorem came to, to impact the Fantine geometry. So I'll show the simplest possible example of this type. So it's a theorem of Laurent uh, who proved the conjecture of Lang. Of course, the conjecture was, was more general and the theorem was more general. I'm just showing a kind of uh, a baby case. So the theorem is as follows. Suppose you have a V, which is a curve, an irreducible curve in C star square. And suppose that it's not, this curve is not a subgroup and not a coset of a subgroup. When you consider C square with its uh, group law given by multiplication. Uh, then the theorem says if it's not a coset of a subgroup, it contains finitely many torsion points. So finitely many points where both coordinates are roots of unity. And uh, okay, there are, uh, many ways to prove such a result, but I will show uh, an idea following uh, the strategy of Pila and Zani. And for simplicity, I assume that this V is defined over Q. Uh, it's not important, but just, uh, just to simplify the presentation. So in, in this strategy, we will somehow uh, use the pila wilkie theorem. So first, the first question is, well, this is algebraic data here. Where do transcendental sets come from? So pillow wilkie theorem says nothing, as I said, about the algebraic sets. It says something when you have definable sets that are not algebraic. So the place where we get transcendental sets is from this uniformizing map. So I'm going to uniformize C star square by the exponential map. In fact, I'm only uniformizing the, the unit circle because I only care about the roots of unity. They sit on the unit circle. So I'll just uniformize the, the product of unit circles by 0, 1 square using these exponential maps. And the nice thing about this map is that it takes the uh, roots of unity here to rational points here. Right? When, when 
s is rational, e to the 2 pi s will be a root of unity and vice versa. Uh, so this is what we will use. So first of all, let's take the pre-image of our curve. So this will be now a set x in 0, 1 square. And this is just defined by analytic functions restricted to 0, 1. So it's certainly definable in a no-minimal structure, yeah. r sub n, one of the basic minimal structures. Uh, now you can quite easily check in this case that x contains no semi-algebraic curves. That exactly corresponds to this condition that v is not a coset of a subgroup. If it were a subgroup, then this x would be just a, a linear curve. It would be algebraic. But uh, when it's not a coset of a subgroup, it's not algebraic. In general, this is what is called the functional transcendence result. In this case, it's not uh, a very difficult result. In, in other kind of uh, incarnations of this strategy, for other contexts, this can be quite uh, a non-trivial and important step. But uh, here, you can really do it by hand. Anyway, suppose that uh, we know it contains no semi-algebraic curves. Then the pillow wilkie theorem tells us that if we count rational points of height h, this will be sub-polynomial. It will be less than h to the epsilon, say, for epsilon equal to 1 third. Now, on the other hand, suppose that you do have a torsion point. So let's say p and q are roots of unity, and we write it as the image of some s and t. Then I let h denote the height of s and t. And as I said before, this is roughly the order of the root of unity. Right? So if you have a root of unity of a certain order, then the denominator of this, the corresponding uh, rational point will be exactly that order. So the height of this pair is roughly the order of the root of unity. Now, from the theory of cyclotomic polynomials, we know that uh, P and Q have many Galois conjugates over Q. So the number of Galois conjugates is roughly the same as the order of the root of unity. So because the root of these roots of unity have roughly order h, they have, say, more than h to the one-half Galois conjugates. And each of these conjugates, because v, recall I, I said it's defined over q, then each of these conjugates are also going to be in v, and they are all going to be roots of unity of order h. So they will each give us a point in this transcendental set, x1h. So that means that the number of points in x1h is at least h to the one-half. And now we get a contradiction. It's supposed to be bigger than h to the one-half, also smaller than h to the one-third. So this is how this strategy works in general. Uh, and this strategy works not only in this example, but in many, many other examples. And it always works in kind of the same way. So the idea is that you contrast an upper bound that you get from Pila Wilkie with some lower bound on the Galois orbits. Okay, and how, I mean, what is specifically the lower bound of on Galois orbit? It depends on the context. So the types of lower bounds that we use are, let me give two common examples. Uh, one is for a billion torsion points in a billion varieties. This is due to David or uh, in some other forms to Masser. So if A is in a billion variety and P is a torsion point of order N, then the Galois lower bound says that the number of conjugates of P over Q is at least a constant depending on the abelian variety times some positive power of n. Okay, so the number of uh, Galois conjugates grows polynomially with the order of torsion. And uh, if you take, for example, uh, CM abelian varieties inside the Ziegel modular variety, you get a similar result. So let's say I, I consider point P corresponding to a CM abelian variety, uh, principally polarized. And I consider the number of Galois conjugates of this P over Q, then the Galois orbit lower bound due to Zimmerman says that this is bigger than some constant, depending on the genus, times a power of the discriminant. Okay, so instead of this order of torsion, now we have a discriminant. It's the discriminant of the ring of endomorphisms of this CM abelian variety. Now, if you don't, if you don't not familiar with this uh, notion, it's not so important. What's important that, is that you always have some measure for the complexity of your, uh, the points that you're interested in, like order of torsion or discriminant of a CM point. And we want to say that the number of Galois conjugates grows like some positive power of this uh, complexity measure. And when that works, the Pila-Zania strategy works. Now, these proofs uh, both use what is called transcendence methods. 
So in this case, it's really done directly by transcendent methods. And in this result of Zimmerman, a, a transcendence method is used in the proof because the proof depends on the isogeny estimates of Masson and Wussorts, and they are proved by transcendence methods. Now, transcendence methods uh, is kind of a general name for a strategy of proving things. And actually, Pilo Wilkie also fits this strategy. So the, the general strategy is that you are trying to uh, study rational points or algebraic points on some transcendental set. And the way that you do it is that you construct auxiliary polynomials. Uh, you combinatorially construct them to be very small on the set. And then you see that they are so small that they have to vanish on the algebraic points. They have to either vanish or be large on the algebraic point because you know the height. But you made them so small that they have to vanish. And in this way, you, you can get some information about algebraic points living in a transcendental set. Uh, so that's a transcendence method. And that is also basically how Pilo Wilkie works. The only difference is that in transcendence methods, let's say when you prove this kind of thing or this kind of thing, usually you use polynomials whose degree depends on n, or the degree depends on the discriminant. And in order to do that, you have to kind of understand your transcendental set well enough so that you can estimate how things depend on the degrees of the polynomials. And we don't know how to do that in all minimal geometry. So in all minimal geometry, we just know that for degrees or polynomials of a fixed degree, we have some nice finiteness properties, but we don't know to, how to estimate how things grow with the degree of the polynomial. So Pila Wilkie is very, very special in that you don't need auxiliary polynomials with the degree depending on h. Okay, in this uh, theorem here, you just use polynomials of the degree depending on epsilon. That is why here we have some constants, asymptotic constant depending on epsilon. We know nothing about them, but the degrees of the polynomials do not depend on h. Uh, so that is why we, we can't really hope to get these sharper results in the same way that we get Peter Wilkie. We would have to be able to do something a bit more refined in order to, to get these types of results. Uh, okay, so let me talk about some general conjectures in this direction. So first of all, this asymptotic cannot be sharpened in general. So h to the epsilon, it is known, for example, by, by examples due to Pila, to be roughly the best that you can do in the if you consider analytic curves, for example. There are analytic curves that have very, very close to h to the epsilon rational points on their graphs. Uh, but Wilkie conjectured that if you start with a set that is definable, say, in R sub x, so it's definable only using the algebraic operations and exponentiation, then you should have a much, much sharper bound. You should have the number of gh points is polynomial in g and log h. Again, Wilkie had it with g is equal to 1 here, but this is a, a natural extension. So th the idea is that these types of counterexamples, that where you get this kind of asymptotic, they are some lacunary serious functions built by hand. But if you start with a God-given function like the exponentiation, then you don't expect this type of behavior. And uh, a few years ago, Harry Schmidt uh, made the following discovery. So he related this to Galois orbital lower bounds. He, he showed that if this conjecture holds for a large enough structure, not just for Rx, but for some suitable structure, then the Galois orbital lower bounds would follow for abelian varieties and Shimura varieties. I mean, these two examples that I showed before and, and maybe in other contexts. So this is a very simple argument. Let me just uh, show it in this basic case of C star that I, I considered before. So suppose you have a root of unity, P in C star, of order n and degree g. We want to show that the degree grows like some power of n. That is the Galois orbital lower bound in this case. So Schmidt's idea was that you consider the graph of the exponential, exponential map restricted to 0, 1. And now P gives you an algebraic point on this graph. And also every power of P gives you an algebraic point on this graph. Okay, because it would be rational here and it would be a root of unity here. Now, what would be the, the degree and the height of these points? Well, the degree is g, but that's our assumption. And then also every power will have degree at least g. And 
On the other hand, the high, I mean, okay, and here it would just have degree one, because in, in zero one it corresponds to a rational point. On the other hand, the height in C star is zero, because roots of unity have height zero. And in zero one, the height would be n, the order, right? Uh, same thing that we used before. So basically, all of these powers give us a gn point. So it means that in this set, uh, this set is transcendental, so we count gn points, there would be at least n points, one for each of these powers. But on the other hand, the number is supposed to be polynomial in the degree g and in log n. Okay, so n is less than a polynomial in g and log n, and then it's a very elementary estimate that this implies that n is less than a power of g. Okay, and, and this is what we wanted to prove. Okay, so this way you can get this Galois orbit lower bounds for uh, roots of unity, but you can also do the same thing, almost really verbatim, for abelian varieties, for example, or even for uh, this case of CM points in Shimura varieties. So I'll say maybe a little bit more about that later. Okay, so the question is, uh, for Schmidt's strategy, we want to know that there is something like Wilkie's conjecture, but for not just for Rx, but for some you know, natural class of structures that would include all the functions that we care about. So the question is, can we make something more, a larger class that where we expect the Wilkie's conjecture to hold? Not just Rs, but some more general class. And for this, I will introduce uh, now the notion of sharply or minimal geometry. So this is a kind of candidate for, for this type of theory that is supposed to be more tame from the arithmetic perspective. Uh, so we start with a gen, which is just a no minimal structure. We're going to refine this notion. So definitely we take a no minimal structure. And now we will introduce some extra structure on it. So I will view this no minimal structure as just a collection of definable sets. Okay, so it's a collection of subsets of R, R square, R cubed, and so on. And I'm going to introduce a filtration on this uh, on this collection. Okay, so it's a it's a filtration, it's a, like a double filtration with two indices. The indices I denote them F and D. F is called the format, and D is called the degree. And it's an increasing filtration. So when you increase the format or increase the degree, you just get a larger, uh, a larger piece of the uh, Now, the idea is that F records some information like, uh, say, dimension, some generalization of dimension, and D records information like degrees. Okay, so if this was, say, an algebraic structure, I would think of the F as being the ambient dimension and D as being just, you know, the sum of the degrees of the equations that define the set or something like that. And now we will have some axioms that tell us that under the logical operations, this format and degree grow in some controlled manner. Okay, so I will say that our structure is sharply O minimal if you have the following axioms. So first I want unions, intersections, complements, and projections to behave nicely. What do I mean? I mean that when you take a union of sets, uh, the format is going to be the maximum of the formats of your sets. The degree is going to be the sum of the degrees. Similarly, when you take intersection, the format, I, I let it be the maximum plus one. It's not very important. This is just some, I mean, if you increase the format by one here or here, it's, it's just to make things technically convenient. But the important thing is that the format of the union or the intersection or the complement of the projection only depends on the format of the sets that you use. And the degree is depending polynomially on the degrees of the sets that were used to build the set. So I'm saying that the degree of a union or intersection is just the sum of the degrees. And the degree of a complement or projection just remains the same. Uh, so this is, these axioms you can really put on any first order logical structure. It has nothing to do with O minimality. You can do it and maybe it makes sense and it could be interesting for other structures. But if we want to talk about O minimality, we should, we should say more. So I have the first axiom relating to specifically to structures over the real field is that if we take algebraic hypersurfaces in Rn, they have format n and degree given by the degree of the hypersurface. Okay, so it means that our filtration is consistent with what we expect the filtration to be on the algebraic part 
okay, and the, and the part which is generated by the real field operations. Uh, so this is about this is not about the first order logic, but it's about structures over the real field. And finally, this is a last axiom is about O minimality. It tells us that the number of connected components of a subset of R, which has format f and degree d, should be a polynomial in the degree. And which polynomial it is exactly depends on the format. Okay, so again, we are there are two parameters. We hope that everything will be polynomial in the degrees and somehow depending on the format. We don't care about how it depends on the format. This is some kind of more effective version of the axiom of O minimality. O minimality just says that when it, whenever you have a subset of R, it should be finite. And now we are saying shouldn't just be finite, the number of connected components should grow polynomial in the degree. Okay, so the first question is, uh, we define something, but is it a reasonable notion? Are there any examples of this? Uh, and the reason why you can you can hope to that it would be reasonable is that uh, the theory of Hovansky, where, what is called the theory of Fafian functions, it is really one of the origins of O minimality. It was used to prove the O minimality of R sub X and more generally of the Fafian closure. Uh, and it already has this uh, kind of sharp flavor. So Hovansky defines some format and he defines degrees for the Fafian functions. And he shows that if you have a system of equations, then the number of connected components grows polynomially in the degrees with very explicit bounds. So it seems that, uh, I mean, Hovansky's theory makes a step in this direction. The only problem is it's only for systems of equations. So it's not about uh, structures. If you want to get a no minimal structure, you should close under complements, under projections, and so on, and, and you should verify these axioms. Uh, and this was studied by Gabriel and Vorobyov in a sequence of uh, many papers. And they did define this kind of uh, filtration on, uh, on the structure of uh, Fafian functions. And they almost got my axiom. I mean, they almost got this sharp or minimal filtration. They, all, they had only one problem, which is that for the complement of a set, they could only prove that, I mean, they got effective bounds for the format and the degree for complement, but it was the, the format was also depending on the degree. Okay, they couldn't, in my axiom, the format of the complement should depend only on the format of A. And uh, in their result, the format of the complement was also depending on the degree of A. But unfortunately, this one letter, which is wrong in the axiom, it really ruins everything. Because uh, as I said, the axioms are developed, I mean, they are written in such a way that you want to get polynomial dependence on degrees, and you stipulate nothing about the dependence on the format. Okay, so as soon as you put the degree of your set into the format, now the constants somehow depend on this format. So they somehow depend on the original degree, and it's not polynomial in the degree anymore. So it's, uh, it kind of greatly limits what you can hope to achieve with this theory. And this was not some small technical thing that they didn't notice. We really don't know how to, how to fix it. I mean, we don't know how to prove that the complement has a format independent of the degree. And another way of, uh, kind of putting this problem, uh, so the, the way actually that they approached computing this complement is through cell decomposition. So let's say you have a collection of definable subset of Rn. So the most basic operation in O minimality is to form a cell decomposition compatible with all of these sets. Okay, you could say that the axioms of O minimality are written in the way that they are exactly because they allow us to do cell, cell decomposition. If we couldn't prove cell decomposition, then we would choose different axioms. That is kind of the, the main result that makes O minimality work. So the question is, if you now have a sharply O minimal set, can you do sharp cell decomposition? Do you know that the number of cells will really depend polynomially on the degrees and on the number of sets? And do you know that the sets will have a format that only depends on the format of the original sets? Uh, and unfortunately, we don't know the answer. So it, it's kind of the same kind of problem that Gabriel Vorobyov had is the, is the reason why we don't know this answer. And to me, this makes this would make kind of this theory pointless. I mean, there's no point of defining the sharp O minimality if you can't do 
cell decomposition because cell decomposition is the key to almost every construction that you make with you know minimal geometry so a few years ago with Vorbiov we find a way not to solve this problem but to circumvent it so what we proved is that even though for the filtration that Gabrielov and Vorbiov used we don't have a good bound on the complement and we don't know how to overcome this you can make a different filtration uh, and with this new filtration the restricted puffing structure is sharply or minimal and it has cell decomposition okay so you have to kind of modify the notion of your format and degree for this to work and that is why it is it is kind of good to think about this axiomatically you you forget about which specific representation you use for this filtration you can just i can tell you as a black box that we construct such a filtration which is sharply or minimal with cell decomposition and then you can just use the axioms uh, and in fact by kind of just uh, repeating this proof formally in the context of a general sharply or minimal structure we can prove a similar result also for every sharply or minimal structure so to the, together with novikov and zach we prove that for every sharply or minimal structure you can modify it, you can construct a new filtration where it will still be sharply or minimal but it will also have this sharp cell decomposition so in this sense when you have a sharply or minimal structure you can do cell decomposition you just have to start by modifying your filtration uh, okay so now let me tell you what are what is i consider to be the, the main conjecture in this area of sharp or minimality so first of all you can ask is this really a, a more general notion so or is it that every or minimal structure is, is sharply or minimal actually if you choose the proper filtration but the answer is no this is a more specific notion uh, so for example r sub n is of course an or minimal structure but it is not sharply or minimal because you can find analytic curves some kind of graphs of lacunary functions where the number of intersections with an algebraic curve will grow faster than any polynomial in the degree of the curve. And so this cannot be sharply or minimal. No matter which format you associate with this gamma, you cannot get a polynomial depending on the format in the degree of the curve. Okay, so Rn is not sharply or minimal. Uh, and I would say that this kind of gamma, even though it's tame for real geometers and it's included in R sub n, it's not tame in the Diophantine sense. Okay, this is the type of gamma that could have h to the epsilon rational points instead of polylog h. So these sharply or minimal structures are exactly designed to exclude this kind of gamma. This is like the arithmetic analog of a space filling curve that we want to exclude in the geometric situation. Okay, so Rn is not, but what what is sharply or minimal? So the conjecture is that whenever you have natural functions coming from geometry, they should live in a sharply or minimal structure. Okay, that is some kind of maximalist version of Wilkie's conjecture. So functions coming from geometry certainly should include the exponential map, but uh, I mean, more concretely, I would like to have such a structure that contains, for example, all periods integrals of algebraic families, as sections of Gauss-Mannin connections, these kinds of functions should live in, in some big sharply or minimal structure. And we are far from knowing this. So, so let me just kind of list two of the best results that we have in this direction. Uh, so the first one is a, an old result with uh, Novikov and Sergei Kovenko. So this was uh, in the Inventiones 2010. So what we proved is that there is, if you have a one-dimensional family of uh, algebraic varieties and you take period integrals, so you integrate some algebraic form, there is a uniform bound for the number of zeros of such an abelian, or such a, a period integral. Uh, but this, uh, there is a uniform and explicit bound, so we can write an explicit bound depending on the degrees of the family, but it's not a polynomial bound, so it, it doesn't have this uh, like polynomial growth that we expect in sharp or minimality but even just getting a uniform bound was was quite difficult it was a long standing open problem called the infinitesimal hilbert 16th problem it's related to bifurcations of limit cycles and perturbations of hamiltonian systems uh, so this result would follow kind of 
very easily in much greater generality and in much greater sharpness from this conjecture. Uh, but as I said, I mean, the conjecture is far from, from being known. So another more recent result that I have is uh, I have polynomial bounds, so bounds that are growing polynomial in the degrees for systems of equations. So now it's not just one variable like in, in, in this case, but systems of equations involving leaves of general algebraic foliations. But this result is not uniform. So this result was completely uniform. This result here, it, the bounds that generate when you approach some kind of bed locus. Uh, so what is needed really is some kind of combination of these two results. It would be very uniform, but also in, in several variables and growing polynomially. And it currently seems very difficult to, to combine these two things. Uh, but nevertheless, I will list some applications showing that even this limited result already gives many things in the Fantine geometry. So, uh, I mean, certainly if we could get this general conjecture, we would, we would get a, a lot of applications that I would, uh, I'm going to list uh, later. Okay, so let me say something about point counting in sharply minima structures. So, first of all, we have an analog of the pillar wilkie theorem. So, this is a joint result by myself and uh, John, Schmidt, and Thomas. So, basically, what the result says is if you have a set in a sharply minima structure, then there is a version of pillar wilkie. I'm counting uh, GH points in the transcendental part of a set, and it's going to be a polynomial in the degree and in H to the epsilon. And the polynomial depends on the format, the degree of the points, and on this epsilon. So this basically means you have a pillar wilkie theorem, and you know that the, the asymptotic constant depends polynomially on the degree. You don't know how it depends on the other data. And this is the best that we can do, uh, as far as I know, for, for general sharply minimal structures. Now, to, to get a better result, to, get in the, to go in the direction of uh, the Wilkie's conjecture, let me introduce another condition. So I say that the sharply minimal structure has sharp derivatives if whenever you have a definable function of a given format and degree, then all of its derivatives, this is multi-index notation, so I'm considering higher order derivatives, they will have format which is independent of this alpha and the degree which is growing polynomially in this alpha. Okay, this is what you expect when your function satisfies some differential equations. Okay, when, you, when you have a function satisfying differential equations, you take derivatives, you can kind of re-express these derivatives as polynomials in the original function. So this kind of behavior, it, uh, it captures this thing that we expect when we have functions satisfying differential equations. And for instance, this restricted Pfaffian uh, structure that was uh, the subject of the work of Chovansky and Gabriel of Novorobyov and so on, it does have this property of sharp derivatives. And very recently, together with uh, Novikov and, and Zapp, we proved that when you have a sharply or minimum structure with sharp derivatives, then you get this polylog bound. Okay, so the number of GH points is a polynomial in the degree of the degree of the set, the degree of the points, and in log of the height. And the corollary of this is that Wilkie's conjecture holds in Rx. So it settles the original conjecture of Wilkie for Rx. I should mention that Rx is not yet known to be sharply or minimal because it's not restricted Pfaffian. It is a general Pfaffian, but you can still get this corollary in a, in a little bit more roundabout way. Uh, so this is uh, kind of the best result that we have so far in the direction of this uh, polylog counting. And now I want to just make a few comments about the types of applications that you can expect from having this theory of sharp or minimality. So I'll first mention the, the Andre Ort uh, conjecture. It's maybe the, the, the most famous application of this uh, approach using pillar wilkie in the Fantan geometry. So suppose that you have a Shimura variety S and V is a sub-variety. Then Andre Ort, the Andre Ort conjecture, now a theorem or by the work of many contributors, is that if you suppose that V doesn't contain any positive dimensional special subvarieties, then it contains finitely many special points. Okay, that is the statement. And you can hope to make it effective or to be computational. Uh, and uh, what we get from sharp minimality is, is as follows. So suppose that 
you know that the universal covering map of S is definable in a Sharpier minimal structure. Then we would get that this finite set of special points can be computed in polynomial time. Okay, you can actually compute these special points. And this basically comes by following Pila's growth, but using the fact that we now have good polynomial estimates for some constants that come up in Pila's group. And this theorem, it actually doesn't require this. It actually follows from my result on foliations. So even though that result has some technical problems, it's enough for this theorem. Uh, I, I, I do need to mention that this is only an existence result. So it says that there is a polynomial time algorithm, but we don't know what the algorithm is because the algorithm depends on some universal Ziegel constant. There is a constant. We don't know what it is unless we assume the Riemann hypothesis. But uh, once you take this constant, you hardwire it into your algorithm, then the algorithm works. Okay, so that is a small caveat. I'll, I'll give one additional example, another kind of very um, common type of application of Pila Wilkie that has many other uh, like versions and generalizations. So this is a work of Masser and Zani on the Pell equation. So suppose you consider a Pell's equation over polynomial. So I fix some D, a polynomial, and I look at this equation, and I try to solve it in polynomials, A and B. So if these were integers, you can always solve it unless D is a perfect square, but what about polynomials? Uh, what Masser and Zania showed is that if you now let your D depend on a parameter, then there is some natural geometric criterion. If the criterion is satisfied, then you will always be able to solve it. But when this criterion is not satisfied, there will be only finitely many parameters T where it is solvable. Okay, and again, you can ask, well, when it is finite, can I actually compute this finite set of T's where it is solvable? And again, if we assume our conjecture on sharp minimality, we would get this. So just by following the proof of mass lasagna, we would see that the set of these T's is computable in polynomial time. If you give me an encoding of this D, then I can compute the, all the T's and the algorithm would run in time, which is polynomial in the degree and the bit lengths of all the coefficients of D. Uh, and again, this actually, you don't need the full conjecture. It, it follows from this result on foliations. Uh, okay, so these are two applications in the direction of you know, computational complexity and computational solvability of some of the Fantine problem. Uh, I want to finish with one different kind of application about Galois lower bounds. So I mentioned that uh, Schmidt has this uh, strategy for proving Galois orbit lower bounds using polylog counting. So what we want in the case of Shimura varieties is the following type of lower bound. So if we have a special point in a Shimura variety, the number of Galois conjugates should be bigger than a constant depending on the Shimura variety times some positive power of the discriminant. Okay, this is what Zimmerman proved uh, in 2015 for the Ziegel modular variety. And he proved it as a consequence of two facts. One of them is a height bound. So the log height of a special point is less than uh, a constant times any, any power of the discriminant. So discriminant to the epsilon for any epsilon. This follows from the average Colmez, a very deep result uh, by many people. And the other ingredient that he used was the mass of Wusthold's isogeny estimates. And neither of these ingredients were available for the general S. It was only available for AG. That is why under Oth was proved only for AG. And uh, so using this Schmidt strategy, we were able to uh, eliminate this isogeny estimate step using polylog counting instead. So together with uh, Schmidt and with year 5 we proved that if you have this type of uh, height bound, then it would give you the Galois bound for every Shimura variety. You don't need isogeny estimates. And this was based on this polylog counting. Again, you don't need the general conjecture on sharp or minimality. We could use my result on point counting with foliations. And then a few months later, uh, Pila, Shankar, and Zimmerman proved that this height bound actually holds for general S. So they reduced actually the, the height bound from general S to the, to the height bound for AG in some highly non-trivial manner. And uh, combining with our result, 
their result actually finished the proof of Andrew or for general S. And now you have the height bound, the height bound implies the Galois bound, and then using PILA strategy and a lot of machinery that was already known at that time, it was already known that this would imply uh, Andre Orth for arbitrary S. So uh, I think there's an interesting uh, kind of application. It's, it's different compared to the previous two that I showed because this is really a place where polylog counting is essential. So this type of application cannot be proved using the standard Peter wiki. You really need this polylog counting. And, uh, you know, the polylog counting, the, the conjecture, Wilkie's conjecture of polylog counting has been around from the beginning of the story. It was in the original paper by Pila and Wilkie. But, uh, so it appeared in the first act, if, you, if you'd like, of the show. But it's only now in the final act where it, this gun is actually used to fire. <laughs> so it, uh, now we actually are using this polylog counting to get a new result in the Fantine geometry. And actually the proof the general proof of Andre Ott now depends on this. And uh, yeah, I hope very much that, uh, I mean, other kinds of applications of parallel counting will come up in a similar uh, fashion. So I'm, I'm out of time and I'll uh, finish here. So thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much, Gal. Uh, can you join us now? And Dimitri as yeah. well. Good, good. Uh, that's a great talk. Thanks very much. Now, I didn't mention, but you can put some questions on Discord. Maybe we have a few quick minutes if people can get a quest question down quickly. You you can see them, Gal, yeah? And if, if anyone... Yes, let me go to this logic section. Yeah, so if somebody wants okay. to put something in Discord in the logic section, then I'll see it, yeah. Uh, I don't see anyone. <laughs> don't be shy. We had 19 participants, which is pretty good, I think, for these meetings. No, no one there? Have last lecture. <laughs> Do you want to say anything, Dimitri, to add to Gal's? Video or at all? Or no? Guy was fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then. Well, perhaps we should finish there. Thanks. Thanks very much for the presentation, Gal, for the video, and thanks to you both. And uh, to the. Okay, thank you, Alex. Thanks very much indeed. Okay, bye for now. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.